So my name is Mihaly uh, and uh, I worked quite some years with the, the market model of Capri and I, I worked quite a lot of uh, policy impact analysis with this. So basically looking at uh, trade policies that affect the agricultural sector, but also the, the market part and international agri-food trade is important for also for the viewpoint of the EU domestic agriculture policies. So for example, for the impacts of, of changing the common agriculture policy, it is always interesting to look at the impact on other countries. Um, just give you an example, for example, for food security issues. Uh, so there's this connection here. Uh, today's presentation, um, so as far as I understood, so far you looked more in the supply model, so the supply part of Capri, where basically the agriculture production is, is simulated for, for the EU and for a few other EU countries. And today we will look at the market part a bit more closely. And this is the interaction with the rest of the world, so with the other countries. And um, one of the important points there is, is how the prices, the price effects are calculated and what is the feedback mechanism between the supply and market model. Um, yeah, so this is a bit the outline of, of what I will present today. So first I, I will go through the different building blocks of the market model. Uh, so you might have heard already that there is something which is called the market model of Capri. Um, we will look at the different equations in this um, and what are the main parts and building blocks, really like Lego blocks that, that build up the market model. We will talk a little bit about the, about the supply and, and market model linkages. Um, so basically the, the basic linkages that we um, calculate the supply impacts with the supply part and then there's a price feedback from the market. But let's have a look a bit closer on this. Um, then I would like to give you an example uh, how you go from the theory, so economic theory, right to the GAMS code. And the example I chose is the demand system, what we are using in copy. So basically I will start with equations, um, but don't worry, I only show the equations just to understand that there is an economic theory behind. And uh, just for an illustration, how we translate it from the equations to actual GAMS code. And then we will also look at the results with the graphical user interface. Yeah, yeah. Um, a little bit more details will be given on the, on the trade modeling part because it's the core business of the market model. And then I prepared an illustrative example, which is uh, a trade war scenario. And trade war in the sense that a few years ago, um, the US introduced some, some heavy tariffs import tariffs on in the steel industry on, on Chinese products. And um, as a response, um, China was banning uh, the import of soybean products. So this is a very in, interesting example of between sector uh, impacts in trade. So basically something is happening in a sector like the steel industry, and this might have an impact in the agriculture and food sector. Yeah, let's, um, so, this is the basic scheme of, of the Capri Monex system. This is what you can find on the website, actually. I, I co copy pasted from there. Um, and the two main parts are here, the, the non-linear regional programming models, that's the supply part. And if you have uh, a global multi-commodity model, that's the, that's the market model. So we will look at this part, particularly in this presentation. And of course, if we go a bit, you know, one level deeper into the, into the GAMS code of the model, um, probably you have seen in, in the previous presentation this, this slide already. So this is basically the, the net of the different GAMS files, how they, collect, how, how they connect and then what they drive. Um, with this, um, you know, with this finger, I just wanted to point on the correct GAMS files. So if you really want to have a closer look at look on how this uh, is actually uh, driven in the GAMS code. So how the market model is executed and, and what is calculated. This is the starting point where you have to start. This is after the presentation. If you're more interested, you can have a closer look. Um, from the very basic conceptual level, the market model is a very simple 
market equilibrium models. So there's the scheme, uh, there's the graph that you can find in any introductory economic textbooks. So you have uh, supply function, demand function, and there is somewhere in between where they cross each other, you can have the equilibrium price. So this is what you what we have in mind when we talk about a market equilibrium model. Um, this is, there is an equivalent um, um, formulation of this, uh, this property to maximize the sum of producer surplus, which is the green area on the map, and the consumer surplus. Uh, no, so the, the previous one was the, um, was this yellowish color and the green area is the consumer surplus. But the point is that you have to maximize the area of these two triangles in the graph. And that's an equivalent uh, formulation of finding an equilibrium. Um, this is only important because the GEMS code, which we implemented in the direction, uh, will be a direct maximization problem. This is what you will see. Okay. Um, what are the building blocks of the market model? Um, so one of the important building blocks are basically first order conditions of behavioral models. And it sounds a bit complicated, but it's not at all complicated. So we have some behavioral models like utility, utility maximization for the consumers. So they try to maximize their utility uh, given a budget constraint. Then we have profit maximizing farmers. So they try to maximize their profit under given prices. Um, so those are the behavior models. And mathematically, we, we simply calculate the first order conditions for these optimization problems. And those are the equations that you will find in the market. Model. So those are one sort of blocks of the, of the equations that we will look at later on. Um, of course, we also, for some behavior models, we simply follow the dual approach. So instead of profit maximization, you might find cost minimization, which is the dual problem of the same optimization. Um, and just a few examples here. So we have cost minimizing feedstock mix calculation, um, both for the for the feed demand and but we also have it for biofuel processing. So tomorrow we will have a closer look at biofuels, but you can already be, be prepared that when I talk about biofuel feedstock, I basically think about the raw material that is used for biofuel production. So this is actually the, the wheat and maize and, and other agricultural crop products that are used for producing biofuels. This is what we usually call biofuel feedstock. Um, what else do we have on this slide? Profit maximization over processing margins. Yeah, so basically in the market model we have both the primary agricultural products, but also some of the processing industry. One of them is, is the processing of oil seeds to oils and cakes, um, which we looked at in the previous session as well. And you will find a profit maximizing approach here as well. But of course the processing industry maximizes the profit based on the processing margins. So those um, raw materials will be used the most, which are relatively more profitable. That's the basic idea. Um, sometimes I stop so that you can stop me at any time. You can raise the hand in the Zoom or just, just shout using the microphones. If something is not on, please interrupt me at any time. This is not the case. I simply continue. So we have seen the first order conditions. That was one of the building blocks. Now the we have some supply and demand equations, which are not directly derived from the optimization problems. For example, the land supply function, which is a semi-log formulation. Uh, semi-log means that you have one log function on the right-hand side, but there's nothing in the left-hand side. So to be very basic. Um, and this is what drives the land supply in this case. We also have biofuel demand share equations. Um, just to explain this, this graph below, so basically the, uh, the blue line would be how the share, biofuel share in total fuel demand is changing. And you can see that it's related to the relative prices. This is what you can see on the, on the X axis. So and more expensive, the, um, the, the biofuel becomes compared to the fossil fuels, 
the less it will be produced. So the demand is, is decreasing. And then we have a nice uh, sigmoid mathematical form to, to drive this behavior. So it's also the behavior, but it's not derived from directly from the from an optimization problem, but is estimated. Yeah? Then we go to the balances. So we have if we have supply and demand, they should at some point meet each other. And this is usually happening at balances. So we have market balances, for example, you can think of the supply and utilization account of the FAO, where you can have production and um, consumption and all the domestic demand in one table. And basically you want to reach um, a closing balance. So the, the same amount that you, you produce or, or is also uh, or exported. And of course, we sometimes have to calculate with waste. So there is something which is uh, sneaking out of this system. But that's what we want to achieve is a kind of closed system which is in balance. We also have uh, nutrient and energy balances in the model. So basically, the, the total nutrient and energy content of, of the feed, feed mix, so what the animals eat, should cover the, the nutrient and energy needs of the animals. And then we have fats and protein balance for the dairy products. Um, so basically, the, the fats and protein, which is included in the, in the raw milk, should be distributed between the different dairy products. You will see that in the market model, we have dairy products like, like cheese um, and fresh dairy products and so on. And those are produced from, from raw milk, which is not really marketed, not really traded in the trade model, but we will usually find uh, our traded commodities. So this link is, is very important. Um, other equations you will find in the market model are, are price linkages or price sense functions. Um, so basically the, the nice equilibrium price that we have seen at the crossing of supply and demand, those are theoretical market prices, but those should be translated or transmitted to the producers. So what the producers or agricultural farm, farmers or holdings will see as a price, that's different from the theoretical market price that we calculate with the model. Uh, there are functions that transmit this theoretical market price into concrete producer prices and concrete consumer prices. So that works also for the supply and the demand side of the approach. And uh, regarding the processing industry, this theoretical price has to be translated into processing margin. So that, that will basically define the, the profitability of the processing industry. What else? So you will also find equations in the model with two different trade policy instrument, instruments. What kind of trade policies I'm thinking of? Um, well, they can be ordinary custom duties or tariffs. So basically when you import an agriculture good from another country, you have to pay um, a tariff on, on top of it. So basically the importers pay. Um, this can be, this tariff can be an ad valorem tariff, which means that it's a percentage of the price, or it can be a specific value like uh, 50 euros per ton. Um, we also have some more complicated trade policy instruments. Um, for example, the tariff rate quotas, which is basically a tariff which is changing or depending on how, um, how big quantities are imported. Um, and we have some really EU specific uh, trade policy instruments in the model, which are important for modeling this common agricultural policy in the right context. Um, and just, just uh, to make you the list, so it's a flexible levy. So again, uh, basically exporters has to pay a levy, which depends on the price relations. So if prices are already high in the EU, this levy is quite small. But if there's a big price difference, then the levy can be substantial. There is also public intervention in the model, um, which is getting less and less importance in the EU. But in the past, it was, it was a huge political topic. Some of you might remember of um, uh, milk lakes and, and then, you know, <laughs> and vines. So basically, the prevention system produced a large oversupply. So 
much more production in the EU than, than was demanded, and then it has had to be dumped on international markets, which created a lot of disturbances in, in the inter, international markets and a lot of, lot of distortion. Okay, we also have export subsidies in the model, but those will be phased out if the WTO discussion uh, will be successful. Um, the WTO is the World Trade Organization, which governs the international trade of most of the countries in the world. And we implemented an enterprise system for fruits and vegetables. Again, the enterprise depends on the relative price differences between the countries. That was a long uh, introduction on the different building blocks. So if you have any questions, then, then please ask now. I, I wait a few seconds. Sorry, maybe um, will, will you later also um, show us where they come into action and how, how or is, is this a, too, too deep into the code? Oops. Um, yes, I will show um, one example where we can, we will go through from basically from the equation uh, right to the game score. So All I will right. show some game score that, that you can see. Great, thank you. Okay, let, let's go, let's move forward. Yeah, it seems that there are no other questions so far. So please ask now, yes? Yeah. Well, okay, if, if not now, then we can, we can yeah. talk later. Um, okay, so this is about the regional coverage of the market model. And um, well, you have to be aware that the EU as a country block is represented by um, an aggregate region in the market model uh, in terms of trade. And there are an even more disaggregated level in terms of the production of the EU. So depending on if we are talking about um, agricultural production or if you are talking about trade, you might find different regional aggregates concerning the EU. And this, uh, this nested figure is, is about this particularity, which is important for analyzing the results. So basically the, the point here is that the EU has two market model regions in the country model version that we are using. One of them is the EU-West, so the 14 old member states, because the UK is not anymore there. And the other big block is the, is the block of the new member states. So those who joined in 2004, seven, and then Croatia. Yeah. And this is the level where the international trade is happening, but the balances for the individual member countries, they're close at the individual member state level. So you will also find market balances for the different countries. It will be much clearer when we go to the example and you, you can actually explore the results with the graphical user interface. Okay. Um, just to make it a bit clearer, I, I will try to share my screen with the GEMS ID, and you can follow this on your computer if you want. Um, and let's let's see how these regional aggregates look like in the code. Um, so. Can you see my screen now? Yes, no, but in the presenter mode. Oh. But it's okay, so. Can I mean, you see my file explorer? Or yeah, 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 no. Okay. okay. Um, so basically the... So together with the presentation, you can download some result files which were made available for you on the training website. And one of them is called SIM, INI, and then some numbers there, which basically includes um, most of the parameters and set definitions of the, of the model and the market model that we are using. And if you open them, open this file, then you can also find the different uh, regional aggregations and regional sets that we are using. 
And let's go back to the actual question. So what we have here is a question for you was to open this file and uh, check the levels of the regional nests. Uh, we have something which is called RMS SOP. So those would be the member states that are that can be found in the supply models. That's why the SOP. We have the RMS. Those should be the, the countries that has um, supply equations in the, in the market model. And then we have the RM regions, which are the regions that can trade between each other. Yeah. And we just wanted to find the code for Slovenia in all these three different regional aggregations. So first I go to RMS, and then you should find Slovenia somewhere there. Yeah, it's there. So you can see that it's included here. Um, if you go to the RMS um, set, you can also see the different EU member states and also other countries. Well, well Slovenia is, is here, but you can also find countries that are outside the EU. And that's the point. So we have supply equations also for non EU countries and all of the countries outside the EU. So we have some, something like Pakistan, Bangladesh, China, Japan, and so on. So this is one level further up. And if you go to the countries that can trade with each other, that would be the arm region, then you will not be able to find Slovenia anymore because this is included in one of the EU aggregates. And this aggregate is called EU East. Yeah? So you, you will see that Slovenia will be in the EU East category. I hope that is clear now, but if not, then please uh, raise your hands. In the meantime, I try to share again my presentation. So could everybody follow this? I mean, this was the database file we anyway also use for, okay, good. And Roland, Rolando, you all remember this, yeah, we looked at. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, so it comes back. So I think then you can continue. Okay. Let's continue because time is fine. Can you see my presentation now? Yep. Yeah. Unfortunately, I have to start from the beginning. <laughs> okay. Um, and similar to the to the regional aggregates, you can also find the linkages between the different agricultural activities and the products, something like we have a different code for rice cultivation and different code for the actual milled rice, which is the which is the commodity that is traded. But let's keep this exercise. You can do it at home if you if you like, and go to the example that I promised so that we go from the equations right to the games code. So the human demand, human consumption, copy. Um, the modeling follows the dual approach. So we have expenditure minimization in the model, which is mathematically described here. So it's um, minimization of expenditure under a given uh, constraint here and under specific assumptions on the functional form. Forms, you can calculate it with a unit as the important. Choose the functional forms so that uh, the expenditure minimization, minimization problem can be written as, uh, as a unit expenditure function. Yeah? And uh, with the specific form that is, it looks like this, so this quite complicated um, formula with the, uh, with the parameters. It's important to mention that we are using a flexible functional form and uh, I explain here why. Well, the flexible functional form basically allows us to do uh, a good second order approximation to the actual demand function at a given point. And uh, those flexible functional forms are usually, uh, can be smoothly, uh, so they are smooth in the second order, so they can you can have 
the second order deri derivative derivatives at this point for these functions. And why this is important is that we can elasticity. So basically what we do when we calibrate this kind of demand function is that we take um, demand elasticities from the from the literature and we calibrate this fun this functional form and the whole demand system um, to these elasticities. Why this is important? It's important so that the reaction of this calibrated system is similar to those what is actually estimated in the literature. So what we would basically expect um, as a reaction from the consumers. Yeah. You can see how mathematically the first of the conditions are derived. So you can see that the indirect utility function becomes uh, this formula here and the F, the large F is, is an important part of this equation because that's um, those are the commitments. So basically the consumer, some part of the consumer expenditure is committed for some consumption um, and, the, and the other part is highly price driven. Um, and those are the formulas that you can actually see in the GAMS file. And I simply copied here one of the equations. So you can, we can do the translation of, of this demand equation into the GAMS code. You can see that we try to follow the, the mathematical, mathematical formulas also to some extent in the code. So when you can see x, x, xi underscore, you can see, you can find very similar notation in the GAMS code. Um, then let's go through it, through this equation. So basically you have, you have an equation which is conditional on, on basically that uh, the consumption is not fixed and there is human consumption in the initial point. So that's the uh, meaning of this conditional part here. And then you have uh, the consumption quantity, which is the left-hand side of the equation. So that's the xi. I have a scaling factor here because in the market model and generally in the coffee model, we try to always scale the, the model so that it can be numerically easier to solve. So this is the scaling factor. So we scale uh, the consumption with the initial consumption. The same, um, the same part can be, find, can be found also on the right-hand side of the equation. So that's simply a scaling factor. Um, the GI, what you can see is, is directly called V underscore GL demand GIS. So it's very similar. Um, what you can see here in the in the brackets, so y minus f is the same what you can see here. So here you have the, the income levels minus uh, the committed demand, so the GL demand f. So that's the same, and we have the additional term here, which uh, p underscore p d g l, which corresponds to f i, and this is the calibrated term of this demand function. Yeah. So basically that's how we, we can directly translate all the mathematical formulation and equations into GAMS code and you can do it vice versa if you want to study how it works. Um, if you want, uh, you can do it after the presentation. So basically you can directly relate all these mathematical symbols here from the equation to the corresponding variables and parameters. I went through this now during the presentation, but as a reminder, you can do it after the presentation if you will. Um, um, I stopped yeah, here again for collecting some questions. Ex exactly, so uh, do we have uh, some questions with respect to the demand representation here and the example in the code? Maybe you are explaining also me a bit because I'm not in this part of the model that often. So what's about this negative consumption or demand uh, formula here? So, so how relevant yeah, so, is it and for what is it made? So, yeah, so this is the, the quantity uh, yeah, equals, so to say the demand function we have here, which should be up downward sloping somehow. Yeah? 
Um, but this negative term, so plus underscore cons quant neck. So under which condition uh, is it required here? Yeah, normally it's positive and only the first part, so the first one kicks in. So the V on the soap consumption plan. But in, in some cases, and it's basically due to the, the commitment terms, which can be in some cases very high compared to the non-commitment term, we can slide under given price, relative price changes to the negative domain with the consumption. And for this, we apply um, a so-called fudging function, which is simply uh, a numerical solution to, to basically avoid having negative values. I mean, I, I did not put it into this presentation because it's an introductory session. Yeah, and okay. this is a relatively advanced topic, but the, the issue here is that it basically, we try to avoid that this very small negative values uh, could basically destroy the solution. So the, it could give, um, see even a numerical error message when trying to call it against. What we do here is that we fudge it into a very small positive number because those are anyway small negative numbers so that the solution can be done. So it's a technical... It, it's only a technical issue. Uh, uh, issue. So it has nothing to do that the consumer produces something. Yeah, I mean, we have to be aware that we are talking about the a numerical model, which is quite complex and big. And sometimes some of the equations or, or code that you can find here is nothing to do with, has nothing to do with the economic theory, but it's purely to make the model numerically working. So that's kind of... Do we have some other questions? I think this is right now not the case. I continue. Mm -hmm. So it's on, on the Arlington input demand system. So basically that's a, that's a system that allows you to model bilateral trade between the countries. And the basic Arlington assumption is that you can differentiate uh, the products that you consume depending on where it comes from. So basically, if consumers um, drink wine, using the Arlington import demand system, you will be able to tell if that wine is coming from France, from Spain, or from whatever country, or produced domestically. And this is what the Arlington import demand system is doing. Uh, this is, of course, important because what we, we see in reality is that the same product, like wine or you know, or whatever, uh, the same product can come from very different places. <clears throat> and even if it's, um, if it's produced in a country, a large portion of the uh, consumed commodities are imported, so coming from other countries. There are some simplifications, of course. Um, and this kind of nested system that you see here is a is a kind of uh, simplification because if you would like to model all the possible combinations of, of commod commodities and countries so that uh, a commodity can, um, uh, can be imported from any countries, then that would easily uh, blow up the, the size of the system. So basically what we have is a nested system. Uh, so consumers are differentiated between different commodity groups and then between the commodity groups, there is, there is a domestically produced and an imported part. And the imported part is, is broken down um, to the different uh, locations, so to the different exporter countries. So this, these arrows are wrong, those, those should be in the imported part. So the imported part is actually broken down to the, the single, single trade links or single trade flows that are coming from other countries. No. I think um, there's a question. Yep. Roy, you had a question. Yeah. So, sorry, but so, so in this way, I am um, this, uh, this, uh, this, um, this demand uh, segmentation. Or can can we do it as well for for other uh, products or for other goods such as uh, uh, meat uh, and differentiate between uh, animals, for example, cows, uh, uh, pigs, etc. 
And so that's one part of the question. And the second one is, therefore, can we here model as well shifts in uh, diet regimes? Yes, so starting with the, so basically the, the commodities that we differentiate in the, con, in, the, in the model that will be like uh, the different meat products. We have beef, we have poultry meat, we have pork meat, uh, sheep and goat meat. So all those are available. And for each of those, um, we, can, we can have the share of the domestically produced uh, beef that is produced in the country and the imported one. And the important one can even be broken down to the different trade flows. So where that beef was actually imported from. So that's coming from Brazil, Argentina, or New Zealand, something like this. And regarding the diet shift, yes. So it is one of the ongoing research with Capri to model different dietary compositions for the consumers. So something like, what would happen if, if people would be more vegan? So the, the larger share of the population goes uh, for, for vegan or flexitarian diets so that they eat less meat. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, good. Um, I cannot see the... I can't see the cameras, so I don't know if there's a, there are any more questions. But let's go. Let's no, we check that for you. Um, there's no no uh, hand rise right now, so you you can continue. I let you know. Okay. Yeah. So the the different equations that belong to the Arminton system. So you have uh, a utility function which follows the approach which is usual in computable general equilibrium models. So this might be familiar for some of you, if you work on this field, um, that uh, constant elasticity, elasticity of substitution form. So basically the uh, substitution elasticities. So how consumers substitute uh, the different uh, products in the, in the consum consumption basket. So that elasticity is constant and not changing uh, depending on the income, for example. We have different elasticities at the lower and upper nest, meaning that um, the, the elasticity, how people or consumers can switch between domestic and imported goods is different um, from the elasticity that, elasticity that we apply for the different um, exporter countries. Yeah? So typically there is a larger variation, larger change expected. So people can change easily from um, French wine to Spanish wine, but probably they do not switch uh, that, uh, that quickly from domestically produced wine to imported wines. Yeah. So this is what is, is meant here. And I just inserted here the first of the conditions um, for this system that you can, if you have some time, you can also find in the model equations. Um, what are the advantages of using the Arnington approach? So the big advantage is that we can model bilateral trade, so the trade between the different countries. And it's also possible to, to model simultaneous imports and exports. So it's possible that um, EU countries import, um, for example, cheese from, from American countries, but at the same time, they export cheese to those countries. So this kind of cross-holding, which is which is reality, which is happening in international trade, can be nicely modeled with this approach. Um, with the kind of nested structure, it's easier to implement. So it's relatively efficient in terms of the model size. And um, the system can be nicely calibrated to, to the databases, what we have on international trade. So the observed prices and quantities, what you see in the different um, trade statistical databases can be used and the model can be calibrated to those trade flows and relative prices. And those are very appealing properties. Uh, of course, there are some disadvantages. Um, for example, we are not really able to model <clears throat> emerging trade with the Arnton approach. So if, if the trade nowadays is, is very small between two countries, then it's from, from 
due to the mathematical properties of the system, it's basically not possible to model a very large expansion of trade in those in those those bilateral trade relations, which is sometimes an issue um, if we are doing policy impact analysis and if we are if we try to model very drastic changes in international trade. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see how this looks like um, in the model itself. So basically, what you can see in terms of international trade in the model, if you open any of the result files that we provided during this training, uh, you can go to a table which is called import flows, price and tariffs in the market model. And there you can have a look at the actual bilateral trade flows, which we often call the bilateral trade matrix because it simply looks like a two-dimensional two matrix. Uh, you have the importer countries and the exporter countries in the rows and columns. And then you can find how the different agriculture products are traded between those countries. So this is a standard output of the copy market model that you can always check. And now, yeah, I just, we can maybe go through together on this. So how to find these results. I stop again the sharing of the presentation and I try to share my, my user interface. Hopefully you can see it. So I'm now in the copy works step run scenario. And then I will use this task run scenario only with the market model because we are focusing now on the market part. And then we can explore the results. Well, um, from, the, from the training website, you can, you can download the baseline file, which is called like this. And there is also an example that I provided on the trade war exercise, which will come a bit later. Let me load both of these results with the graphical user interface. So it's loaded and we can look for the table that I mentioned. So it's under the table group trade and then imports. And then you can have the detailed import flows in this, in this table that I choose. Um, as was already shown, probably before you can rearrange the table so i will simply put the importers into the rows the exporters into the columns and uh, let's see we can choose one of the scenarios i will go for the baseline and let's pick one of the products which is created at moments And I will show only the values. So basically you can see in the different cells, the value of imports between the two countries. Yeah, so let's pick an example. So for example, between Switzerland imported the Europe from the European Union West. So the Western countries, 123,000, no, sorry, million euros of beef, of beef in value. This is the baseline result. And you can do the same, um, same exercise for all the different regulations. So if we go back to the exercise. The exercise was asking for the biggest soy being exported to China. Um, in this case, what I will change with the structure of this table. I look for soybeans. I pick on China here. And as you know, you can sort this table by clicking on this button. So you can find the biggest, in, biggest exporters to China. In this case, 
those are the Mercosur countries. So Argentina uh, exports the most soybean to, to China, but the second one is the USA. So we will see in the trade war example that the banning the imports from the USA will have a big impact on this trade. So the rank of USA in the soybean exporters to China, that was the question in the exercise. It's, it's two, there's a second. And the, it also asks for the biggest poultry export. For that, we would need to change it to the EU. Let's pick the EU West, for example. We can change the product to poultry meat and we can do the same sorting yeah? as I did before. So the biggest uh, exporters are, are Th Thailand and Brazil. Those are the most important exporters of food to me to the EU. Let me know if I was too quick or if you need any help to check the same results here. Uh, I wait a few seconds here. Could you, um, could you show quickly your, in the pivot table, the, if you click on right, uh, click how your organization is, scenery, activity, if, if there is not, no activity, um, how do I get it in? Because yeah. I had... If there is no activity, then probably not in the same table. Ah, okay, that might be the case, yes. So let, let's, let's see it again. So we have trade, import, and there we have four tables and pick the third one. Ah, all right, thank you. I think then that's yeah. it. Great. Because the other tables might be aggregated, so then you cannot see an activity there. Yeah. And um, also a very quick question. Um, have you compared this with, uh, with actual data? So with, uh, with the reality, if the model behaves uh, well? Reasonably well. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically the... No, I didn't understand. Uh, a no for the first or the second part? <laughs> I, I see two questions here. So first yeah, is, yeah, yeah. is the database. And the second is how it reacts. Um, yeah. So let's, let's come to the first one. So this, this uh, trade matrix that you see here is based on statistics. So we use uh, trade use the trade matrix as we download it from the FAO website. But of course, we do some, some averages so that we try to, um, so the, the yearly fluctuations, we try to reduce it. Um, we also have to do some consistency uh, adjustments in the data. So basically that the trade matrix fits the balances. It is often not the case with statistical databases. Yeah, so if you, if you would add up all the all the supply and demand in the different countries, and you would try to match it with the trade matrix, well, it usually it doesn't match fully. So there you have to adjust it. Um, but this is a quite automatic process, so you you can you can be fairly sure that it it's it's quite good. Yeah, it's a quite good match. In terms of the reaction of the system, so how it behaves in different under different scenarios, well, that's that's always always debated yeah of course we, we can have a large debate on what would be the right um, parameter estimate for the substitution elasticities for example or the different elasticities that we are using for the supply and demand functions and, yeah. um, there are some reports or studies with country with sensitivity analysis so basically basically where where people try to change those parameters within the range and they investigated how the model reacts or how the model behaves. Um, that's the usual way of, of trying to uh, get the grip on the, on the accuracy of the model. And I'm not sure if I answered the question. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Okay, um, so I suggest that we move forward with the presentation. Um, yeah. 
So some, some words about the trade policies that we have in the model. So as I said before, we have tariffs and we have some new specific instruments like the flexible levy system or the enterprise system. Um, something on the tariff rate quotas, which are important in agricultural trade. So those were meant as only transitional measures in the tarification process in the WTO negotiations, but they remained here. So we have a lot of tariff rate quotas applied in different um, parts of the world, and those are very frequent for agricultural trade. The basic idea is that you have a, a lower tariff rate if you don't export a lot to a, to a given country, but if you overshoot the threshold, then this tariff becomes larger. So basically this two-tiered tariff approach, which I put it on the slide, is the basic idea of the RQs. Um, what is important for us as economists is that when the quote is filled, then it creates an economic rent. So basically there is a, a rent which is created with this market distortion um, and it can go to the, to the exporters, but it, it also be kept in the importer country. How the, this economic rent is allocated um, is not really what, what Kakri can tell you, but we can have different assumptions on the, on the rent allocation and we can implement it in Kakri and we can do welfare analysis on this. Let's see, maybe those are slides that you have seen um, in your studies. Uh, that's uh, an important demand equation here and, and an excess supply function here, which is king at the quota limit, because below the quota limit, we apply a smaller tariff rate and over the quota limit, we, we apply higher tariff for the imports. And that's why this function is king. Um, depending on how the um, import demand is located compared to the excess supply, we have different um, positions. So if this is below the quota limit, then the economic rent is, is not created. Oh, sorry. If, it's, um, if it's already reaching the quota limit, then there is economic rent which we create and it can be even so large that is is much above the quota limit and what we can see is over quota imports so countries export even if they even at the higher tariff rates um the flexibility system is also explained here but i would like to skip this because it's not really important for the exercise that we want to do later something on the price formation and uh, and the price transmission functions that i I covered a little bit in one of the earlier slides. Uh, so the value of imports, well, it's simply quantity multiplied by, by import price, but how we get the import price, this is the important question. Um, there are two acronyms here, CIF price is the cost insurance and freight price. So basically this is something which includes um, or the transportation costs and all the related uh, issues. Um, which is basically something which we create as FOB fee on board price. Maybe some of you have heard about it who, who are more interested in international trade. So basically that's the price you pay before the, um, the good is leaving the country. So that's what you pay on the, on the border. So we have to add the transportation cost until it reaches uh, the final destination. This is what we can see here. Um, of course, we apply a tariff component if an import tariff is in place between the two countries. Yeah, so basically you have an import price, which is the price which you pay when the, when the good enters the, uh, reaches the border, plus you apply the tariffs or other policy instruments that the, the country might apply on top of it. This is how different market prices in the different uh, countries of the world are interlinked in country. Sorry, could you quickly just uh, explain what the names are again, the FOB and CIF? FOB is free on board. Free on board. So on board on, board on the ship, board of the ship, basically. Uh -huh. uh, CIF is the cost insurance and freight. Uh-huh, freight, okay. Free. free, thank you. Yeah. Let's see. Um, 
So let's go to the to the last part of the presentation because we don't have too much time left. And I wanted to show you this trade, for example, which would be retaliatory tariffs on US soybean exports to China. Yeah, so I explained a little bit the context. So basically, as a reaction to the uh, increased tariffs in the steel industry, China decides uh, to put an import ban on US soybeans. Yeah, and this is what we would like to implement with, with Capri in the market model. Um, yeah. So we'd like to show you again where you can find these files so that it's absolutely clear for everybody. So basically, you can download not only the result files, but you can also download the GEMS files that you can use. Um, as was probably explained yesterday or the day before, the, the basic scenario files are located in the SAM folder. And there is a subfolder here, which, I, which is called trade policies, um, bilateral trade policies, and this is the trade war scenario file as you can see here. Um, let's have a look at it. I quickly open this one. It's very simple because it's one line of code. Yeah. And basically what is happening here is, it, is that we set uh, the trade between China and USA for soybeans. Um, so we, we set the set there a prohibitive here which is a technical instrument so we, to basically ban uh, the by one single line against okay, so uh, what, what is here TRQ and then CUR? Okay, uh, yeah, I have to explain. TRQ uh, and T is the TRQ quota limit. So this is what we have seen in one of the previous slides. So that's the, that would be, we basically implement the TRQ in this case, with a very high tariff rate. And uh, could you also explain the, uh, what the definition of peel uh, dash TRQ bill at? The first uh, This one? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, it's simply a parameter, which uh, usually takes um, all the data of different TRQs in Capri. Uh, so basically, you have one, two, three, four, five dimensions. Um, the point is that TRQ, a bilateral TRQ, this is the BILAT, which is here, always refers to two countries. So we need two dimensions for the countries, first and second. We need another dimension for the product, what we are talking about. So it could be soybean, it could be beef or only product. And then there's something which is, which is a variable of the of the TRQ system, yeah. So it, it could could be the threshold, it could be the 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 in quota tariff rate, so the lower card tariff rate. It could be the higher tariff rate. So it is something like a variable um, which relates to the TRQ. And the last one is the time. C O R is is the current one, yeah, which is uh, used in Capri at many places. So this is a placeholder for the current value of this, this parameter, but it could be a year. So we could have here something like 2020 or 2021. Yeah. And prohibitive in GAMS, um, it's called an acronym. No? Uh, so basically it's, it's not the number that we set here, but we put a special value, which in this case is prohibitive. And this is what we put into this parameter. But it could be it could be a number. It could be one hundred. Uh, for example, if the if the TRQ threshold would be one hundred thousand tons. More technical questions because I I, I see that it's maybe interesting for the participants. So I'm, I'm not sure if it was explained how to use the, the scenario editor in the previous presentations, but you can use this one 
to create your own scenario. So this is one of the um, basic scenarios that can be used in the scenario editor. Okay. So if you if you agree, I will simply go to the user interface, and I will load in the two results: one of the one for the baseline and the other one for the state of our scenario. And look what is happening in this case. Yeah, uh, let's go through these results together. This will hopefully clarify a lot of things. Um, let's do it again together. So. I'm here in copy work step run scenario, and I will use this copy task. So it's called run scenario only with the market model. And if you click on this exploit results button, then you can you can select the scenarios. Yeah. In my case, I have many many scenarios in my folder. I have to look for it. The baseline is called uh, a lot of numbers in the beginning, but then. CAP after 2004 ref, which is stands for reference, and I flagged it with underscore OM. OM stands for only market. So those are results derived only with the market model. Yeah. So you can you can run Capri only for the supply model. This is what you did in the previous session. You can run Capri only for the market model, or you, or you can run the whole system, and then these two parts are interacting with, it, with each other. In this case, we only use a market model, so I, I flagged the result files with OM. Yeah, and the trade war scenario, in my case, it's, it's called trade war underscore CHN, stands for China and OM. And I simply click on the show, show results uh, button and the results should be, should be loaded. That's great. Um, so I, I do the same matrix, trade matrix that I, that I showed you before. Yeah, so, but in this case, so I put the importers here in the rows. I put the exporters into the columns. I can put the scenarios up there. And I have to select soybeans yeah, because it's called soya seed in the graphical user interface because that's what what is banned in the scenario. Let's look at the quantities. And in the scenario trade war. And the importer country, which I would like to have a look at is China. So I select China here. And then you can see all the different importers here. Maybe it's, it's better if we, if we put the put China to the columns now, so put China here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and I do the same sort thing as before. So. We are in the in the reference scenario first, and you can you can see that USA is one of the top exporters of soybean to China. If I go to the trade war scenario, and I do the same sorting, yeah, USA disappears, yeah, which is sounds good. Um, let's have a look at the main exporters. What we have here, so. The main exporters of soybeans are the Mercosur countries. So basically Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay, and Paraguay. Canada is also an important player on the market and the USA. And we can see how the imports change between the baseline and the scenario. If we click on here, that the GUI shows shows to us not only the values, but values and the percentage difference compared to the reference. Yeah, this is what I'm doing now. And you can see 
that the imports from the US, they went down by basically 100%. So it disappeared completely. There is still a very small number here because it simply cannot become zero. Yeah, so that's a, that's a mat mathematical limitation of this Armington demand system that I, that I presented before. So that this number cannot be zero, but it becomes a very, very small number. Um, the other countries, they take over the, the, the US imports basically. So they take, take over the market shares. Canada is increasing a lot uh, the exports to China by more than 200%. So it's more than, more than three times the, the exports so of the baseline. And there's also a huge increase in imports from the Mercosur countries. Yeah. This is the same, but you can see in the in the presentation slides. Right? Are there any questions until this point? Yeah, I'm waiting a little bit for, for questions or clarification issues. If not, then I, I can still continue a little bit by digging into the results, but I would be interesting, interested to know what, what you think is an interesting result here. So what could be interesting to look at? What would you look at it? You are a policy analyst and you should have a look at the impacts of, of a soybean trade ban between the US and China. So we have seen that um, soybean exports decrease, but what would be the indirect impacts? Maybe, maybe there is an increased uh, trade between uh, China and uh, the South, Southeast Asia countries and India also. Might be an increase in, in imports to compensate and also to Australia. They are, they are not really big soybean exporters, that's the point. Um, not, not, not specifically soybean, uh, soybeans, but they could sub be substituted, I mean, you know? Mm -hmm. Good point. Other ideas, maybe? I mean, I just collect a few ideas and we can look at, look at together in the GUI, if this is reflected in the curve results or not. I mean, uh, think about what soybean is used for. What is it used for? Soy sauce, for example. Animal. Animal. Yeah, yeah. So it both can have an impact on, on human consumption and both on, on animal production, yeah, because it's a major feed item. So we might have a look at the, the market balance of China to see how the consumption is affected. Um, but what would actually drive the the demand side in this case. What is the Let's what say, is the instrument in the model that drives the demand change? Could be the the diet change. The... Okay, so what what is happening? That okay, they cannot cannot import sodium from from the US. Okay, and we have seen that they started importing from other countries, but something has to drive this change. And what drives this is the price, yeah? So what we probably will see in the results, hopefully, that there is a small increase or even a significant increase in soybean prices in China, yeah? So they have to make um, imports, you know, profitable for the other countries so that they can they will ship more soybeans than in the baseline. Yeah? So that we must have a kind of price increase to drive this additional imports from other countries. 
and this price increase will have an impact on the demand because if prices go up in the Chinese market, then they will probably consume less or they will, the feed prices will go up, which has a negative impact on, on animal production. So those are the things, the interlinkages that we can see. Yeah, so I propose to, to check these things together. Can you see my screen now? Just can you see my graphical interface? Yes. yes. Thanks. Good. Um, so that was. Let's see the prices because the prices are already here. Okay, that's interesting. Um, what can we see here? There's a huge increase in import prices from the U.S., but this is something that we actually implied in, in the model. So the the technical way of, of banning the imports from the US was to put a very high tariff so that the import price will be insanely high so that nobody actually wants to import soybean from the US. Um, there's, there are different um, price impacts on the, on the bilateral prices. Yeah? So you can see that the Canadian price is, is going a bit down. Really? Brazil and Argentinian price is going up, Why price of Uruguay and Paraguay is going down. So that, that's not something this is it, that we can, we can see here. It all depends on the relative price differences in the baseline. Yeah? It's much better if we go to the Chinese market and check the Chinese market price directly. So let's go to the, no, sorry. So it's under the heading markets. Oh, there's something, yeah. prices, there is something directly on prices. So let's go there. So prices and prices from the market model. Yeah. And there you can have um, different indicators for the prices. We will go through all of them, but let me first select soybeans. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, yes. I guess before you keep on going, may I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, would the model uh, consider weird things or, or how would the model model this? Because I understand that uh, uh, when China was demanding so much soybean from Brazil and Mercosur, Brazil particularly, Brazil even imported soybeans from the United States. So it, would the model somehow um, uh, see this kind of strange flows? Probably, yes, yeah. So this kind of uh, trade diversion, I think this is the term, um, is there in, the, in this kind of farming models. So it, it really can happen in the, in the Capri that um, you have this, um, you know, you, you import something or export it to a third country. So that, that can happen. So if it's, if it's profitable, then yes, the countries will do that. And um, uh, we, can, we can see it actually in the, in the trade matrix. So yeah, let's go back. It's an interesting question, so let's have a look at it. Um, so, for example, what would happen with, uh, with Brazil? Or what we can see is, okay, so how the U.S. exports will, to which countries will they, the exports be diverted? So basically, they cannot export to China, so they should export to some other countries. And we can, we can see to which countries. Um, I put the exporter countries into this as I rearrange with the table so that you can see it nicely. And yeah, so I choose USA and I choose soybean.
for example, European Union will import much more soybean from the US simply because the US will divert the exports to, from China to, to the EU. You can see that, um, but very similar things happen in Africa, so they will export more to Africa and so on. Um, if we go to Brazil, which is one of the winners of this trade war, in the sense that they, they have now new market opportunities so they can export more to China. So they will export much less uh, to the European Union because now they can export much more to Asia. So they have 31% more exports to Asia and 70% less exports to the European Union. So this kind of um, diversion of trade is, is, is happening in the model. It can also happen what you mentioned that the country starts importing something only to re-export re it to another one. This is also possible. Yeah, I hope I answered the question. Um, so let's go back to the to the prices. So, so just just to add on this, maybe so we should also see an increase in import in Brazil, right? Ah, it's a good question because I'm. I'm not sure if they import anything in the baseline that can happen that they don't import anything because they are the biggest producers. But let's have a look. Um, so we can go to the to the product balances, which is the balance of you know production and demand and the import and exports. And if I go to Brazil and soybeans. This is what I see here. Um, yeah, the, you're absolutely right. So there is imports in the baseline and in the scenario it increases a lot. I mean, in absolute terms, it's still tiny compared to the production in the country. Um, but yes, there is a almost doubling of the imported, imported soybeans in Brazil. And this might might come from the US. Yeah, <laughs> let's have a look. Um, no, it's actually not happening in the model. But I guess the the reason here is that simply there is there is no no trade in the in the initial benchmark position between Brazil and US. So it, it cannot emerge, it cannot, cannot increase. This is one of the limitations I was talking about in one of the previous slides. Yeah. So, so, so it's in the case like what the information we get from the Ronaldo is not true, right? In the in the Capri model. Because we check right now whether it's increased from USA or not. And we see that in the Capri model, it's not. It's nothing happening, right? For for the soybean, I guess. Uh, it's it's happening. It's happening to to some trade relations. So we have seen that yes, the uh, Brazil Brazil imports imports more. So it should import it from somewhere, but probably not from the U.S. But it will import from other Mercosur countries. Exactly. So we can. Move yeah, so probably Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay. That's my guess. And yes, so it, it imports more from Uruguay and Paraguay, um, which is again strange, a strange results in this sense because Uruguay and Paraguay could have exported it directly to China, but you know it can happen that it, it exports it to to Brazil if Brazil has a price advantage. Just, just to understand uh, the limita limitation you mentioned before, you okay. said basically that the limitation is that if in the baseline year there was no trade, right? You cannot, you cannot really represent it, uh, represent it in the scenario. So it could also be that there is trade between the U.S. and Brazil, but it cannot be shown by the model. Exactly. Ah, okay. Thank you. So basically, the, the math mathematical function that we have here, if it's if it is zero in the beginning. In the initial point, it cannot be positive in the scenario. 
Yeah. We have some research with company on how to circumvent this problem. So to actually model emerging rates, but in this standard version of Capri, it's, it's not, not functional. Okay, any more questions related to this? I, I see that this is an interesting uh, point for the audience. If not, then I simply move to the prices because this is something we, we forgot to check. Yeah. Um, okay. And because I only have five minutes, so let's let's do it. So you go to the Chinese prices, and um, yeah, Oof. see the soybeans. Okay, so let's start with the market price. So this is the kind of theoretical price I was talking about, um, which sets the equilibrium between supply and demand. You can see that this is translated into a producer price, which is different from the market price, but you can also see that the change is the same. So what we have here is a very simple price margin that we apply. Uh, it's a multiplier. So that's why if the market is changing, by 7.1%, the same percentage change we have in the producer prices. Um, of course, we can imagine, we can implement or, or adjust it, this price transmission to, to more complicated forms. Yeah. The, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's, mm -hmm. Does this um, information indicate that the market price is higher or sorry lower than the producer price so that means that the, the market is losing money in the transaction is uh, is buying uh more expensive than it's selling the, the the product no not really because the market price is simply a theoretical price to what the model is is calibrated to what is more meaningful to compare um is the is the Armington one price which we, we set here and the Armington two price? Let me explain it and it will be clearer. So uh, Armington two price, what we call in Capri Armington two price, is the average import price. Yeah, so it would be the average import price from all of different countries: the U.S., Brazil, Argentina. Yeah, that's the average price. And the Armington one price is the average of imported and domestically produced soybeans. As China is not producing that much soybean, in this case, those are very, very similar. Yeah, it basically the imports defined price. Um, so maybe it's more meaningful to compare the this Armington one price, so that's the, the average price on the market to, to the producer prices. And then you can see that that price is higher than the producer price. I'm, I'm not sure if I explained it totally. Let's move to the consumer price part. So you can see that it's it's high. So that's the price for the soybean which is consumed by by, by humans. <laughs> so that's that's actually that would be actually a, a different product. Um, but you can see that the consumer prices uh, here we apply a relatively large consumer price margin, and then processing margin uh, relates to the processing industry. Yeah. You can see that that's uh, that's basically the only place where it decreases. I'm sorry. Uh... Another question, please. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, please. Go yeah, ahead. yeah. I think. Well, I don't know. It sounds weird. I don't think the soybeans are edible, or you don't eat it as such. It, it's always processed. Sorry, so you, when, do. you do. I'm vegetarian. When you say I do. Consumer eat prices it. refers to uh, processing facilities, I suppose, right? Let's let's check the the market balances. This is what I propose. Yeah, let's see um, what's happening with soybeans in China.
I mean, for me, the uh, the objective was to to let you let your glimpse in the in corporate. So not so much on how the soybeans market is functioning in reality that much that you can you can see what is available in copy and how it is represented in copy. Um, let's see. So we have um, I suggest that we also put the processed products there. So from the soybeans we have oil and cakes. We look at soy cake. Okay. Yeah, so these are the cakes which is used for animal feeding and this is what you can see here so it goes to feed use and then you have the oil which is going to human consumption um there should be something on processing yeah the processing is here so you can see the soy Soya seeds, so the beans, um, that's the demand for processing. So it will be processed partly to oils and partly to cakes. So this is going to the net production of soy, soya oil and soya cake. Of course, you can also import these kind of things. So you could directly import cakes and oils, but this is not really happening in the case of China. So most of it is imported as, as soybeans, as such. And what else we should see here? If I, I don't know if I can add to that, but uh, soybeans are also, well, it's not the majority of it. At, uh, actually, it's a, very, uh, it's a very small part, but they can be direct, directly eatable like any other bean. Yeah. yeah, but but yeah, yeah, but 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 uh, we experienced that also in Europe. But this is mainly homegrown. Yeah, so this, at least, given that it's GMO free. Well, in, <laughs> at least it needs in Europe, needed. but uh, in China yeah. we don't know. But you you see also that uh, I mean, it's, a it's smaller the, the relative size of these two. Yeah, if you see the relative size, I mean, processing is one hundred four thousand. And human consumption eleven thousand. So yeah. and then China ten times less. And I think you see okay. that you, um, you see that in Europe. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, Alex, you wanted to mention something. No, this no, no, no. I mean, this is human consumption. Yeah, for of soy, me, I mean, soy seed. It does it. So, what is meal? Mm -hmm. I mean, very often is also. I mean, I, I assume that uh, soy seed is could also be meal, and meal could uh, is then uh, separated by oil and cake or something like this. Uh, or Mihaly, or when, when you're reading reports, yeah, particular who are not referring to this classification, where is this soy meal related to? I mean, is it is it rather a soy seed then in our case from the database? Or is it uh, soy cake and meal the same? Well, I think I cannot give a definitive answer here. Uh, I, I have it's seen, seen it. part of the of the processing demand. No. Uh, so something like because we, we don't have the meal, so we have the oil and cake um, break breakdown. So it should be there. So it should appear in the processing demand of soy soya seed, what you see here. Yeah, I, I think so. I have say, seen some publication, and then they are not we're talking about that uh, categories, but rather by soy meal and oil. And so I was mm -hmm. wondering, so 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 where, if it means by cake or not, but uh, this is probably the, this question is already too far, but I could, uh, thanks a lot. Um, okay, I think we, at the end of the presentation, so I'm just, I stopped sharing my screen. And the last round of, of questions, if there are any clarification questions or comments. I will check. Do we have any questions? Thanks a lot, uh, Nelly, for this very nice presentation. Also, I think uh, showing that um, 
at the screens or how to access the different numbers in the GUI is, is very helpful for our students, given that they are also having this kind of bands uh, planned as a student group work. Um, have, Jonas. Yeah, I have one, one question. This is maybe also for later. Um, but since since you're here from Eurocare, um, I was wondering if we could have a discussion maybe at the end of the of the week, or also now with you uh, about the opportunities, the work opportunities, if you want to work with Capri. Um, but maybe this is not at the right time. I just wanted to to pitch it already. If there is time for it, some sometime in the week. Yeah, no, I'm glad to talk about it. We yeah, all are um, happy if someone wants to to work with Capri or <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah, we can we can have a short session on this maybe at the end of, end of the week sometimes. Yeah? Great. Thank you. Okay, good. Some other questions more specific to the presentation. Otherwise we uh, can now enjoy uh, say give give applause to me highly. I'm probably this this is uh, okay. we should do. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, greetings to Seville. Yeah, hope hope you to see you in presence soon. Uh, not only by emailing <laughs> some issues. Um, we will uh, have also an exercise tomorrow with you on the biofuels. Yeah. Um, so then you have uh, again the, the the chance and also the possibility to ask questions. Um, but for now, we close the official part of the session, and the group will start in uh, ten minutes, I think. Yeah. So in 10 minutes. So we meet in 10 minutes. Is it okay for you? And uh, right. I, I, I will open the um, I will open the, the breakout groups and then you can log in by yourself. Yeah. So excuse me, uh, Alex. Uh, yes? Can I Sorry? ask a qu quick question in terms of last session? Yesterday, yeah. I mean. Yes, yes, yes. You stay yeah. here and um, yeah. we, we okay. can talk immediately on this, okay? So, see you guys um, tomorrow. Bye -bye. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.